Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. There's a new buzzword in geopolitics, the Quad, short form for the Quadrilateral. A group of four strategic partners, a Quad in the Indo-Pacific is taking on China. The members are India, America, Australia and Japan. Now a new Quad has been formed, the West Asian Quad. Its members are India, America, Israel and the UAE. The focus is the same, countering Chinese expansionism and this is a story that is not told enough. How China is spreading its tentacles in West Asia, how, how country after country in this region is signing Chinese projects. In the past few years, China has expanded its economic, political and security footprint in West Asia. It's the biggest trading partner and investor in a number of countries. In the last 15 years, in fact, according to one estimate, China has invested in projects worth $223 billion, upwards of this in more than 10 countries in West Asia. It is also the biggest global importer of crude oil. It is building strategic assets. So far, China has not disturbed America's security apparatus in the region, but given China's track record, nobody is taking chances. So four partners, India, Israel, the US and the UAE have come together to create alternatives. Their first meeting took place this week on Gravitas tonight. We'll discuss the takeaways and the significance. Also on the show, is Turkey headed to the FATF grey list? The global financial watchdog is expected to grey list Turkey for terror financing. In India, another win for Buddhist diplomacy. A new airport inaugurated in Kushinagar to improve connectivity with delegations from 12 countries participating. In Brazil, the Senate wants to sue President Bolsonaro for mass murder for his response to the Wuhan virus pandemic. And this is a medical breakthrough if there was, ever was one. A pig's kidney is successfully transplanted into a human. We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. During the Moscow format meet on the Afghanistan situation, Russia has pressed the Taliban to live up to international expectations on human rights. We expect the Taliban to meet uh, those uh, demands and uh, requests of the international community about inclusivity and, uh, and uh, basic uh, human rights. Whereas the Taliban asserted that its regime was already inclusive and that the ISIS threat was overestimated. Indian External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar met Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett during his visit to Israel. After the meeting, Bennett expressed the country's love for India and how it views India as a huge friend. After months of living behind bars, about 5,600 anti-military protesters are being freed in Myanmar. The political prisoners were reunited with their tearful family members. Most were arrested during a brutal crackdown this year. More than nine months after India kicked off its COVID-19 vaccination program, the country is on the cusp of a major milestone, inching closer to the 1 billion doses mark. It has administered more than 990 million doses. Britain's competition watchdog has fined Facebook over 50 million pounds for a deliberate failure to supply information linked to its takeover of animated graphics startup Giphy. UNICEF said more than 10,000 children in Yemen have been killed or injured in violence linked to years of war in the impoverished country. 
The United States has vowed to do all in its power to free American and Canadian missionaries taken hostage in Haiti, after kidnappers demanded $1 million for each of the group of 17. At least 46 people have been killed in the Indian state of Uttarakhand, where heavy rains triggered floods and landslides. The Indian Army and Air Force have been carrying out rescue operations along with state disaster management authorities. Liverpool earned a dramatic 3-2 victory at Atletico Madrid to maintain their perfect start to the Champions League campaign. Atletico came back from two goals down to draw level through a brace from Antoine Griezmann. But the Frenchman was sent off in the second half and Mohamed Salah then netted the winner from the penalty spot, becoming the club's record goalscorer in the Champions League. The Milwaukee Bucks began their NBA title defense with a statement 127-104 point victory over their rivals Brooklyn Nets. Giannis Antetokounmpo led the Bucks to their first championship in 50 years, three months back. And the Greek freak was once again the star of the show, grabbing 32 points and 14 rebounds at the Fiserv Forum. China has a new kryptonite, the Quad. Not the one you're thinking about. Not Japan, India, US and Australia. This is a new grouping. It's called the West Asian Quad. What's different about this new group? Two big things. Members and area of operation. These are the members of the West Asian Quad. India, US, Israel and the United Arab Emirates. The first Quad focuses on the Indo-Pacific. This one, the new one, focuses on West Asia. I would say an equally volatile region. Two things are happening here. One, a setback to China. West Asia was the next frontier in the Belt and Road. This new quad could stop China's advance there. And two, new opportunities for India. We're talking both strategic and financial. India set the ball rolling. Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar is on a five-day visit to Israel. On Monday, he joined a virtual summit of the West Asian Quad. He was joined by Yair Lapid, Israel's Foreign Minister, Antony Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State, and Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nayan, the U.A.'s Foreign Minister. They got some good press. The new Quad, the Mideast Quad, the West Asian Quad, all sorts of names are popping up. But there is, is there substance to this new group? Their first meeting had four major outcomes. Number one, they agreed to establish an international forum for economic cooperation. Number two, they set the agenda. Infrastructure, transport, maritime security and trade. That's what they'll focus on. Number three, they agreed to appoint officials for a joint working group. And number four, a proposed in-person meeting at the Dubai Expo. It could happen in the next few months. So four decisions from their first meeting. It's not a bad start, we say. But the key is to build on this, to turn consensus into concrete actions. And if that happens, the West Asian Quad could become China's kryptonite, and I will tell you how. For the longest time, America was the undisputed power in West Asia. That changed in the last decade. First Barack Obama, then Donald Trump. They scaled back American presence in the region, and this has created a political and economic vacuum. Enter China. West Asia wanted to sell oil and China obliged. 40% of China's crude imports are from West Asia. As always, Chinese money ends up as Chinese leverage. So they signed a series of agreements with West Asian countries. Take a look. Comprehensive strategic partnerships with Saudi Arabia, Egypt and the UAE. A 25-year cooperation plan with Iran. 5G projects in Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, plus a handful of projects in Israel, including a shipping port in Haifa and a light railway line in Tel Aviv. In total, China has invested around $224 billion in 15 West Asian countries. And these investments have come in the last two decades, less than that, last 15 years more so. Except for Iran... These are traditional American allies, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the UAE, they're American allies, and they were signing deal after deal with China. So America's motive is pretty clear here. Draw the Arab world away from Beijing. How will they do that? With the Abraham Accords, quite literally, the Trump card. Israel's big focus is Arab recognition. Not even Chinese money can distract them. The U.S. is using this leverage to pull Israel away from Beijing. 
What about the UAE? What's in it for them? A lot of economic opportunities. The UAE and Israel are expanding their business ties. A quad format helps oil the levers. For instance, Israel brings cutting-edge technology. America brings the money. It works for the UAE. Now, where does India figure in this equation, in this new quad? For starters, all three nations are close Indian partners, the US, the UAE, and Israel. Plus, India is a staunch supporter of the Abraham Accords. It's quite similar to India's own policy, de-hyphenation, which basically means deal with Israel and Palestine separately. This quad could be India's window to West Asia. We are talking about joint projects, people-to-people -people exchanges, more than we already have. Tourism, a multitude of opportunities. I know it sounds too good to be true, so let me also tell you the downside of this. What happens to Iran, for instance? India has had good relations with Tehran for a very long time, but none of the others do. Not the US, definitely not Israel. This new quad will no doubt upset Iran. And it comes at a bad time in India-Iran ties. There is trouble brewing over an Iranian oil field. It's called the Farzad B. India has a 40% stake in this oil field. Under the initial agreement, the profits would be split 70-30. 30% of it going to India. But Iran is now backing out. Their government says this deal will not benefit them in 30 years. Well, this may not be the end of India-Iran ties, but it's definitely a worrying pattern. That's where the West Asian Quad comes in, an additional foothold for India in the region. It's an interesting experiment, really. It's a new headache for China, certainly. But a lot depends on what happens next. Can the U.S. bring Saudi Arabia into the Abraham Accords? Can Joe Biden keep his focus on both West Asia and the Indo-Pacific? Or will he cut and run, like he did in Afghanistan? We'll have to wait and see. But we'll stay with the region and look at what's happening with the Financial Action Task Force. It's meeting this week, and they're likely to keep Pakistan on their grey list. And that's not our story tonight. We want to focus on another country that will join Pakistan on the grey list. Birds of the same feather are now set to flock together. We're talking about Turkey. Turkey is becoming a facilitator of money laundering and terror financing. So the global finance watchdog is all set to grey list Turkey. Apparently the decision is now a mere formality. We expect the announcement to be made tomorrow, Thursday. And honestly, no one should be surprised by this turn of events. The Turkish president had this coming, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He's been chasing the dream of a neo-Ottoman empire. He funded his diplomatic adventurism at the cost of Turkey's economy. Turkey was one of the fastest growing economies in the world at one point, then Erdogan drove it off a cliff. Turkey was put on notice by the FATF back in December 2019. The FATF, as you would know, is the Financial Action Task Force. It's a global watchdog for financial crimes. Its assessment of Turkey found serious shortcomings on nine counts and four concerns stood out. Number one, Turkish prosecutors give low priority to charges related to terrorist financing and money laundering. Number two, there was no national strategy to deprive criminals the proceeds of their crimes. Number three, Turkey's ability to freeze assets linked to terrorism and terror financing was weak. And number four, the Turkish banking sector has less understanding of their exposure to terror financing. In other words, Turkey is not being able to prevent terror financing. Turkey was given time to fix these problems, almost two years, but it failed. And now it is heading to the grey list. This will be a double whammy for Erdogan. The FATF's announcement will compel the European Union to act as well. The EU has a money laundering list of its own. It will be forced to list Turkey as a high-risk country, a country that threatens the EU's financial system. How will all of these labels impact Turkey? Well, its citizens will suffer, certainly. Its currency, the lira, will be hit. It has already lost around 20% of its value against the dollar this year. Any further decline will worsen inflation. Food prices in Turkey will go up. They're already sky high. In September, the cost of food went up by almost 29% in the country. And with this grey listing, the Turkish people will have to brace themselves for worse. 
Foreign investors will also pull away from Turkey. The losses could run into billions. The International Monetary Fund conducted a study in May this year and the IMF looked into how a grey listing impacts a country. What happens if you're grey listed by the FATF? The money flow from outside significantly dries up. The losses are equal to 3% of a country's GDP. And going by this calculation, how much money will Turkey lose once it's grey listed? $23 billion, that's according to one estimate. That's what they stand to lose immediately. What is President Erdogan doing to prevent all of this? Does he have a plan to fix this mess? Doesn't look like it. Around a week back, he fired two deputy governors of the Central Bank, and this is not a first. The Central Bank of Turkey has become a revolving door in recent years. Officials are sagged left, right, and center. Whenever they disagree with the president, they're sagged. Since 2019, the Turkish president has sagged three central bank chiefs. How can you expect the Turkish economy to stabilize? It's being run on the whims of a man. And Turkey is paying the price for Erdogan's misadventures. On the world stage, he tried to play savior and leader of the Muslim world. To win brownie points, he began lecturing India. He's been raising Kashmir at international platforms. He's also been protecting Pakistan from the FAT of blacklist. Turkey is one of the countries, remember, that's been voting against Pakistan's blacklisting. Now, Turkey itself is going to be grey listed. Who will save Turkey? It can discuss the strategy with Pakistan in the club of countries that finance terrorism. And while Pakistan takes its friends down with itself, India is touching new diplomatic heights. It is showing the world how faith can bring countries together for a common good rather than dividing them. Earlier today, Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated an international airport in India's northern town of Kushinagar. It's a major Buddhist pilgrimage center. The new airport is a win for India's Buddhist diplomacy. Its inauguration ceremony was attended by a 130-member delegation from Sri Lanka. Also in attendance were representatives from 12 Asian countries. Here's the report. This is India's Kushinagar. It is home to the Ramabar Stupa the cremation place of Gautam Buddha. Kushinagar also has the Matha Kuar Shrine. It is believed to be the place where Buddha delivered his final sermon. Goes without saying, India's Kushinagar is one of the most important pilgrimage centers for Buddhists around the world. Today, Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated an airport here. The first flight to land arrived from Sri Lanka with a 130-member delegation of Buddhist monks, dignitaries and a 12-member entourage carrying the sacred Buddha relic. Attending the inauguration were diplomats from 12 countries Mongolia, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, South Korea, Nepal, Japan, and Singapore. This wasn't just an airport inauguration. This was India's Buddhist diplomacy touching new heights. Why is Buddhist diplomacy important to India? One, because Buddhism was born in India. Two, Buddhism emphasizes peaceful coexistence. Something that India, too, believes in. 3. Buddhism connects India with its neighbors. 97% of the world's Buddhists live in Asia. And 4. Buddhism, like yoga, is India's soft power. India does not have a big Buddhist population. But what it has is historical legitimacy. India is home to seven of the eight most significant sites in Buddhism. India is also where the Dalai Lama lives. In a way, India is seen as a protector of Buddhism. It is only fair that India leverages this image and turn cultural diplomacy into strategic relationships. India has been focusing on Buddhist diplomacy for a while now. 
When Prime Minister Modi visited the United States in September, he gifted Japan's then Prime Minister Yoshihide Tsuga a Buddha statue carved in sandalwood. In 2020, India announced a grant of 15 million dollars for promoting Buddhism ties with Sri Lanka. In 2019, Prime Minister Modi told the United Nations the teachings of Bud, not Yud, was India's contribution to the world. In 2018, when Prime Minister Modi visited Singapore, he took time out to visit a Buddhist temple. In 2016, India announced a Buddhist circuit project. Here's what the Prime Minister said in Kushinagar today. Kushinagar is the convergence of Buddhism with tourism, development and exemplary diplomacy. India already has a five-star Buddhist circuit train, connecting pilgrim sites across India and Nepal. The train covers Bodhgaya, Rajgir, Nalanda, Varanasi, Sarnath, Kushinagar, Lumbini in Nepal, Shravasti and Agra. And it spreads the message of an incredible India. This is Indian diplomacy showing the world how faith can also bring countries together for a common good. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Talking about common good, Wuhan virus vaccines are supposed to be a global public good. But what happens when a vaccine manufacturer starts bullying? Governments are silenced, supplies are halted, and profits take precedence over saving lives. I'm not describing a hypothetical situation here. I am describing what Pfizer is doing. The American pharma giant, it is doing all of this. It is bullying countries to submit to its demands. We first reported about this back in February this year. While countries like India are sending free vaccines to poorer nations, there are companies like Pfizer which are bullying governments. Pfizer asked to be compensated for the cost of any future lawsuits. Pfizer wanted Argentina to put, and listen to this, put its bank reserves, its military bases and its embassy buildings at stake as collateral. These are Pfizer's demands. Look at this. Number one, Brazil waives the sovereignty of its assets abroad in favor of Pfizer. That the rules of the land be not applied on Pfizer. Number three, that Brazil take into consideration a delay in delivery. Number four, that Pfizer is not penalized for it, for a delay in delivery. And number five, in case of any side effects, Pfizer be exempted from all civil liability. Eight months have passed since we reported this. Pfizer has not changed. It is still putting profits above public health. It is still forcing governments to bend to its will. An advocacy group has thrown up more details of what Pfizer does. It has accessed some confidential contracts of Pfizer. And we have a copy. These contracts are with nine countries and blocks. And the details are shocking. Desperate countries are being forced to make humiliating concessions to Pfizer. We went through the entire report. We found six very important points worth highlighting. Number one, Pfizer has the right to silence governments. It has forced countries to not talk about the deals they strike for shots. Number two, Pfizer controls the donations of its shots, not the country that buys them. Pfizer will decide where the shots go. Number three, Pfizer has secured an intellectual property waiver for itself, and this clause is particularly disturbing. If Pfizer is accused of intellectual property theft, governments will pay, not the company. Number four, 
If there are disputes, private arbitrators and not public courts will decide on them. Number five, Pfizer can go after state assets to secure its compensation. And number six, Pfizer calls the shots on all key decisions. It decides delivery timelines and more. These are very serious revelations. I'll give you some more details. Number one, Pfizer is silencing governments. How? Through contracts. These airtight contracts are at the center of everything. They can silence governments in ways you can't even imagine. Look at what happened in Brazil. Pfizer agreed to supply its Wuhan virus vaccines to Brazil. And it sneaked in this clause in the agreement to force Brazil to not share any specifics about its deal with Pfizer. Let me read it out for you. This is what it says. The Brazilian government is prohibited from making any public announcement concerning the existence, subject matter, or terms of the agreement, or commenting on its relationship with Pfizer without the prior written consent of the company. In other words, Brazil cannot talk about the Pfizer deal until it gets an approval from Pfizer in writing. This basically is a private company muzzling a government. And that's not all. Pfizer also gets to decide who will get the shot. Suppose someone wants to donate Pfizer shots to Brazil. Can they do it? They cannot. The Pfizer agreement restricts Brazil from accepting donations. No one can donate Pfizer vaccines to this country. They cannot use the Pfizer shot until they buy it. What happens if Brazil does not comply with these rules? The consequences will be serious. Let me quote from the report again. If Brazil were to accept donated doses without Pfizer's permission, it would be considered an uncurable material breach of their agreement, allowing Pfizer to immediately terminate the agreement. Upon termination, Brazil would be required to pay the full price for any remaining contracted doses. So Brazil will have to cough up the entire payment, and Pfizer won't even have to supply the full consignment of Wuhan virus shots. What happens if someone accuses Pfizer of stealing its vaccine technology, of intellectual property theft? The government will be forced to defend Pfizer. It's unbelievable. We had to read this twice to let it sink in. And guess what? At least four countries have been forced to protect Pfizer's patent, meaning these governments are defending Pfizer for intellectual property theft. While the company is free to use anyone's intellectual property as it pleases. Colombia is one of these victims. I'll explain with an example. Suppose a domestic vaccine maker or any pharma company in Colombia goes to court and they accuse Pfizer of infringing their vaccine patent. Who will be the one fighting that case? Not Pfizer. Even though they're, they're, the, they're the accused party, it's not Pfizer and their lawyers who will be in court. It will be the Colombian government. The government will have to defend Pfizer. And if they lose the case, it will be the Colombian government that will have to pay the settlement, not Pfizer. What if these governments want to get out of these tough contracts? They won't be able to sue Pfizer at home. The matter will go to a secret panel of three private arbitrators in New York. Pfizer will be tried as per New York law and not the laws of the land where it sells vaccines. And these countries will pay heavily if they lose an arbitration. Pfizer can ask a government to shift control of state assets to compensate for losses. What kind of assets are we talking about here? Practically anything that a sovereign government owns. Foreign bank accounts, foreign investments, commercial property, state-owned airlines, even oil companies. Pfizer can take over any or all of these from a government. Basically everything happens on Pfizer terms once a country decides to buy its vaccine. Even the delivery of shots is decided by the company. In Brazil, in Albania, in Colombia, Pfizer gets to decide the delivery timetable for vaccines and the countries will have to agree to whatever they're given, whenever they're given. Pfizer, of course, gets to decide the price. It sets the delivery timelines. It accepts accountability for nothing. And in case someone sues the company, it's the government that foots the bill for the damages, not Pfizer. There is no other way to describe Pfizer's business practices. This is vaccine terrorism. And now we turn to Brazil, where parliamentarians want to charge the sitting president, Jair Bolsonaro, with homicide, mass murder. A congressional report 
on the pandemic says that Bolsonaro is principally responsible for the government's errors committed during the pandemic. 600,000 Brazilians have died because of the Wuhan virus. Will President Bolsonaro now be tried for their death? Our next report tells you. History and science will know how to hold everyone accountable. This was Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro calling for accountability for the Wuhan virus. The date was the 21st of September. And the place was the United Nations General Assembly. One month on, a leaked document says that Bolsonaro will be held accountable for the Wuhan virus. Brazil's parliamentarians want to charge Bolsonaro with homicide. You heard that. Some Brazilian senators believe Bolsonaro should be charged with homicide. Understand why we must jog our memories a little. February 2020. Brazil reported its first Wuhan virus case. The next month, Bolsonaro said the virus was overestimated. In my understanding, the destructive power of this virus is overestimated. By then, Brazil had reported 25 cases. When the country reported its first Wuhan virus death, Bolsonaro called the virus a hysteria. The economy was doing well, but this virus brought a certain hysteria. Ten days later, he said the Wuhan virus was nothing but a little flu. For 90% of the population, this will be a little flu or nothing. In April 2020, Brazil had nearly 5,000 Wuhan virus deaths. Bolsonaro asked his voters, what do you want me to do? And Messiah, but I can't do miracles. What do you want me to do? I'm a Messiah, but I can't do miracles. Bolsonaro was cracking jokes on the pandemic, being downright offensive. He asked Brazil to stop being quote-unquote a country of queers. This president refused to mask up, encouraged people to protest against lockdowns and flouted social distancing rules. He tested positive for the Wuhan virus, but never learned a lesson. Bolsonaro endorsed unproven remedies like HCQ or hydroxychloroquine. By mid-2021, Brazil's infrastructure had collapsed. So far, 600,000 Brazilians have died because of the Wuhan virus. And Bolsonaro is still discouraging people from getting jabbed. This was some 10 days ago. They said I needed to be vaccinated. Why should that be? I have more antibodies than those who got vaccinated. Two days later, Bolsonaro said he was bored with questions on COVID deaths. This is why some parliamentarians in Brazil believe Bolsonaro should be charged with homicide. Also, genocide against indigenous people, crimes against humanity, forging documents and inciting crimes. All of this is a part of the Congressional Inquiry report on the pandemic. A 1,200-page long document that blames Bolsonaro for being principally responsible for the government's errors committed during the pandemic. A formal report will be presented in front of Brazil's parliament soon. It will be up for vote. Since Bolsonaro's party enjoys a majority, a trial looks highly unlikely. That said, the report will definitely hit Bolsonaro's re-election bid. Brazil, remember, goes to polls in 2022. For now, Bolsonaro has dismissed the charges in the report as politically motivated. Just like he at once dismissed the Wuhan virus as a little flu. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Let me take you back to last week. Europe's energy crisis was peaking. Russia was being blamed for creating a bottleneck. Around midweek, Vladimir Putin clarified his position. Millions of people were watching eagerly. Would Putin help Europe? Would he agree to export more natural gas? But Russians were focused on something entirely different. They were focused on her, Hadley Gamble, the journalist who was interviewing the Russian president. What exactly did she do? Her job 
journalism. She asked questions to President Putin. She followed up on his answers. Basically, she did what any journalist would do. Well, not according to Russia state media. They're calling her a sex object. A special operative sent to distract President Putin. That's what they're calling her. Do they have proof? No, they don't. But they do have loads of sexism, and some of it is beyond disgusting, I have to say. Here's what one anchor said, and remember, this is happening on Russia's state-run channel. Let me quote. Hadley squeezed into a tight black dress, fluffed up her flowing hair, and put on a pair of nude, leg-lengthening Louboutin high, high heel pumps. Her legs were covered in shimmering body oil, as though this wasn't a work assignment. Crass, sexist, disgusting. You can take your pick. And the anchor did not stop there. He says Hadley Gamble's gestures were suggestive. How so? Apparently, she moved her legs too much and that she was adjusting her hair. Last we checked, that's called human behavior. Another Russian anchor added a spy twist. Listen to this one. Look at Comrade Gamble. She's also a beauty. Look at Megyn Kelly. She's a woman the Americans brought the last time. She was a blonde. This time it's a brunette. They keep trying to get to Putin. The first anchor was sexist. This one is sexist and delusional. And it's not just the Russian media, by the way. Their politicians are no better. One of them called Hadley Gamble, America's secret weapon. Weapon for what? Asking questions at a public event attended by hundreds of people? There is no espionage racket here, no big plan to distract Vladimir Putin. And will he be distracted like this? This is just another instance of targeting a woman for her clothes, for her looks, and most importantly, for her work. And this problem begins right at the top. Take the Russian president, for example. His conduct was more of the same. At one point during the interview, Vladimir Putin says, and I have to quote again, beautiful woman, pretty, I'm telling her one thing. She instantly tells me the opposite as if she did not hear what I said. When the president says this, what do you expect his mouthpieces to say? Hadley Gamble, though, is not backing down. She posted a picture on social media, this picture. That's a Russian newspaper in her hand. They deliberately used a picture of her shifting her legs on stage. Look at the caption, my best angle, hashtag feminism. Not a bad way to respond to trolls, or in this case, the Russian state media. But we cannot ignore the larger picture here. When women occupy powerful positions or when they interview powerful people, suddenly the conversation turns to their looks. What were they wearing? How were they sitting? What were their expressions like? And this scrutiny is only for women. Let me give you some examples. Last month, a former Donald Trump aide published her memoir. She details a G20 meeting between Trump and Putin. Apparently, the U.S. delegation was suspicious of the Russian translator. Why? Because she was beautiful. The Americans thought Putin wanted to distract President Trump. So did the American media. Let me show you this article by the New York Post. What does it say? Get to know the stunning Russian translator Putin brought to Trump meeting. The article refers to her as a bombshell brunette. So it's not just Russia. It's not just journalists. It's any woman in a position of public visibility, even world leaders. You would remember this front page from the Daily Mail. The two women are former UK Prime Minister Theresa May and Scottish leader Nicola Sturgeon. Now look at the headline. Never mind Brexit, who's one legs it? How funny. Why does society have a problem accepting successful women? Why does she have to be part of an espionage network or a distraction? This is 2021. Gender equality and mutual respect are not up for debate. So to all the politicians who don't understand that and to all the so-called newspapers who find it funny, deal with it or prepare for irrelevance. The Taliban had their big diplomatic test today. Their first major multinational summit, the Moscow format, hosted by Russia. Ten countries participated, including India. The Taliban also sent a delegation. They went to Moscow with one big demand, diplomatic recognition. That's what they wanted. Well, they failed, thank God. The Taliban was gambling on Russia's support. They were hosting the talks. They invited all the stakeholders. 
If Russia recognizes the Taliban, there could be a domino effect. That's what they were hoping for. But Moscow is not ready yet. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the Taliban must work on human rights first. Like most of the other influential countries in the region, we are in contact with the Taliban. We are prodding them to fulfill the declarations they made when they had come to power, including securing an inclusive government, both ethnically and politically, so that the full range of society's political views would be represented in the government. Official recognition of the Taliban is not under discussion for now, and it was told publicly. So that's where things stand. Russia says the Taliban are de facto rulers, but official recognition will have to wait. Russia is preaching human rights to the Taliban. The rest of the talks focused on the humanitarian crisis, how to help Afghans without helping the Taliban. The joint statement is expected to call for a donor conference. And this is something that every stakeholder agrees on, raising money for the Afghan people. They need help. The differences are related to the Taliban's governance or the lack of it. The Taliban is unwilling to act against terrorists, their own kind. They don't have a counter-terror strategy. This is one of India's biggest concerns, in fact. The, the Pakistan-Taliban nexus is brewing trouble in Kashmir. Anti-India terrorists are taking shelter on Afghan soil. Is the Taliban willing to tackle this threat? Well, for that, they must first admit the problem. The Taliban say there are no foreign terrorists in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, it's all the media's creation, they say. The threat of ISIS is not serious. If you, the media, do not exaggerate it, it is not serious. It's a media exaggeration, apparently. The second demand is to announce an inclusive government, one that has women, Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks, a government that is representative of Afghanistan. Again, for that, you must first admit the problem. The Taliban say their government is already inclusive. Government is in Afghanistan now also inclusive. Yeah, uh, you know uh, about uh, 500,000 uh, uh, employers working with us. All of them uh, former, uh, former uh, employers. We need uh, supporting uh, peace in Afghanistan. We need uh, reconstruction in the rehabilitation of Afghanistan. And frankly, we should not be surprised by what they're saying. This is a regime that celebrates suicide bombers. What can they possibly know about inclusivity? Let me show you what the interior minister is up to. Sirajuddin Haqqani, he's greeting relatives of the Taliban suicide bombers. Each family got $112 and a plot of land. They also got pictures clicked with Sirajuddin Haqqani. Though you will notice that his face is actually blurred. We don't know why, perhaps because the FBI is chasing him or because there is a multi-billion dollar bounty on this Taliban minister's head. This is the real Taliban, not the delegation you saw in Moscow, not the spokespersons who come on television. This, a wanted terrorist slash minister celebrating suicide bombers. This is the real Taliban. You can wait all you want for them to change. You can call them de facto rulers or whatever else you want to call them, but the Taliban will not reform. They will not keep their promises. Do you remember what they said in their first press conference? Equality for women, education and opportunities for women. Well, Afghan schools opened 33 days back. The boys are attending classes. The girls are not. If the world still wants to trust the Taliban, it will be complicit in the impending disaster. And before I begin the final story for the evening, I want you to take a look at a small clip. Can you share that banana bread recipe? Sure. It's, it's actually my mom's banana bread recipe, but it's, uh, it's pretty foolproof and super easy. Well, I really appreciate it. I know your mom's a great baker, so it should be good. Do you remember this viral video? It's from a campaign. It encourages victims of domestic violence to signal for help. That's what this woman was doing. The video is heartbreaking. As is the situation worldwide, today one in three women experiences physical or sexual violence and it is mostly by an intimate partner. The government of Australia has decided to step in. It is paying people to escape violent relationships. 
Australia is rolling out what's been called an escape violence payment. The scheme is open to all genders. Victims can apply for it and they will get a one-time payment of 5,000 Australian dollars. That's 3,700 US dollars. $1,500 will be paid in cash, the remaining in goods and services, or direct payment of bonds or school fees. Will this help victims of domestic abuse? Government data says one Australian woman is killed by a partner every nine days. One man is killed by a partner every 29 days. It gets worse in the case of Australia's indigenous community. Government data says indigenous people are 32 times more likely to be hospitalized for family violence. Now, all of these numbers are from 2019. It's pre-pandemic data. Lockdowns resulting from the Wuhan virus have in fact exacerbated the crisis. We don't have reliable numbers from Australia, but what's happening around the world should give you an idea. When the pandemic began, incidents of domestic violence increased 300% in Hubei, China, 25% in Argentina, 30% in Cyprus, 33% in Singapore, 50% in Brazil. This is according to UN Women. The money the Australian government is giving out will help at least some victims escape the violence. And I will tell you why. Surveys have shown that in many cases, a woman does not leave her abusive partner because she depends on him for finances, for paying their child's school fee, for rent, for basic survival. In many cases, a man controls his victim's bank account, his credit card, his paychecks. And there's a term for this. It's called financial abuse. A 2014 survey commissioned by the All State Foundation found that 98% of domestic violence victims also experience financial abuse. So the escape payment will help a victim sustain herself, even if it is for the time being. If need be, pay for a lawyer, pay for a counsellor, even go to vacation for all you know to clear her head. And I know it sounds superficial, but oftentimes even small things help in improving a person's mental strength. So the escape payment is definitely a welcome step. Abusive relationships are a growing problem the world over. Australian Bureau of Statistics says one in six women have experienced violence from a partner. So it is good to see the government doing something about it. But here's a question that we tried debating when we were drawing up the story list this afternoon, when we were thinking of putting the story on the show tonight. To what extent can governments intervene in a problem that is so personal? How many victims will actually be comfortable signing up for this scheme? Is this even sustainable? Australia's own data shows that most indigenous victims are afraid to even report domestic abuse. So will money be incentive enough in, in such cases to leaving an abusive partner? You know, New Zealand offers paid leaves to victims of domestic violence. So do some American states. But how many women or men actually tell their employers about the situation at home? Forget taking leaves against it. I will tell you what happens in this part of the world. People do not talk about what happens behind closed doors. So here's the dilemma. While escape payment is a good start to address domestic violence and abusive relationships, is it enough? What countries must also do is address the root cause of the problem. Why do partners feel they have the right to be violent? Is it because of the lack of a deterrent? Is it because they think they can get away with it? Is it because society see women as a lesser gender? These are difficult questions that governments and societies must answer. So I leave you with a question. Do you want your government, whichever part of the world you're in, do you want your government to roll out a similar escape payment scheme? Send us your answers on social media and don't forget to tag your leaders. We'll wrap the show with it, leave you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.